Here we are. Tell us what Springboard VR is and uh, what your goals are. Sure. Springboard VR, we are the management software behind everything to monetize virtual reality or turn your virtual reality experience into an arcade, right? To, to manage those games, the licensing, all the time, the scheduling. So it really takes place or it takes care of all those things that you try to think about when you're trying to build an arcade. You know, do I sit behind the counter with a stopwatch? Do I have a paper calendar and write down when people are coming in? That type of deal. So we take care of all the booking and all that software end on the back end, right? Give you all the reporting, so that's good. You can actually yeah. turn this into a real business, right? When the first VR arcades popped out, it was just kind of dreamers popping up, doing their own thing, but now we actually have the ability to uh, quantify all that information, take it, put it together, turn it into a real business plan, and actually operate it as a business, right? Monetize okay. all and, those and things. And when you use the word VR arcade, could you specifically yeah. tell us what that is so there's no confusion? Sure, yeah, when you're doing a virtual reality arcade, what you're doing is taking space, and in essence, you kind of think of it as a, a mix between an arcade, a kind of like a coin-operated arcade, and a karaoke booth, right? So what we're doing is we're creating booths, and we do that as well. We actually have a turnkey option where we come in and we build all of it. It's just like furniture, so there's no plans or permits that need to be done. We come in, we build the booth, uh, and we install all the software and the hardware. It's about a 10 by 10 space, which is the average. Uh, and uh, it, it, it can be. It seems small until you put the headset on and realize that we've turned all of that negative space into infinite space. Okay, and that's one station. That's in my one mind, station, right? yeah. How many one station is for one the, player. With a normal entertainment center need. An entertainment center probably wants to look at six. Six. Six is a good number. What we find that because of the throughput option, our average player stays in the booth for a half hour, which is crazy weird, right? That's that high, is. especially like for a coin op or something like that. It's really odd, it's different. But for like trampoline parks, it's very common. People sure. come in and they buy an hour and they stay in the whole building. Right. Or for parks that like to do that all you can play pass, it works out wonderful, right? Uh, but what we've seen is that if you have too few booths, the return on investment is extended to about 12 months. When you get to six to 12 booths, the return on investment's a lot faster and that's just because of the throughput on the weekends. Uh, you know, like with laser tag right. or trampolines, yeah. you're only as good as your occupancy on the weekend. Yeah, right. We, it, see, in our industry, we use ratios of, of ah, gross yeah. revenue to cost. Right. So, give me an idea of what a cost is of a six-station setup, and what you think you're going to, you know, sure. gross in a year. Yeah, the cost on a six-player station. We just finished a bid for somebody right now. It's right around sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars, depending on the features that they put in, and that's all inclusive. Uh, the, what they're going to gross on that by the end of the first year should be about 100,000 to 110,000. Right. Which is pretty much what we're seeing almost globally. Yeah, you know, it's very, and that's the cool thing about working with Springboard. Uh, we have three over 300 locations and thousands of booths that are using the software. So the 300 locations allow us to take a lot of that data uh, and see what's working. In fact, we found a lot of the most successful VR arcades. That's a, that's a location that's going to have maybe 20 stations a bunch of seated virtual reality with the Samsung gear, you know, a couple of party room areas, uh, but they'll have 20 to 30 stations, and they're only charging $25 an hour. So per minute charge, you're looking at that, and that's 50 cents, that's pretty low. That's pretty good. But they are just humming throughout the weekends, why, and during, yeah, right there. This is perfect because nobody can afford to do that in their home. Correct. It's, what, 10, it's almost 10,000 a station. It is. Me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's over 10,000 a station. You get discounts when they're kind of bundled, right? Because you're sharing portions and parts. But uh, yeah, it's uh, no one's going to be able to do this at home. And not many people have a 10 by 10 empty space to play VR at home. Right? One of our clients who does very successful, they, did, they went with a 12 by 12 station. Uh, that's almost free roam style. You shouldn't say that because Yuroslav, the guy who's taking the pictures right now, <laughs> yeah. he set up my house in the living room. He, he set up the R station there, and the whole living room is for sure 10 by 10. There you go. And that's it. You can, we can't have company anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah, you put that thing in. And it, we do it at my house for my kids, and it's moving couches, it's sliding things over, and we're still getting pelted with controllers now and again. Uh, but yeah, Welcome so this is this is definitely an out of home yeah. environment. Some people sure. are afraid uh, that they or they say, you know, why would somebody go to an arcade when they can just go home and do it? 
Well, well, they that. really can't. The system still costs about three thousand dollars just to get the Vive headset, just to get the PC, and then you've got to worry about all the accessories and everything else that they're using. So, they're really this isn't a a lot of people doing it at home. Just like laser tag, you can find laser tag at Toys R Us. Well, you could find laser tag at Toys R Us. What, what um, would be your advice to the, let's say, the typical bowling center yeah. uh, that for sure has that kind of space for an attraction? Oh. And and when should they get in? Should they get in now? Should they wait a year? Now. The longer you wait, just the more expensive it's going to be to get in. Uh, and now is, if you remember the trampoline industry, what, six years ago, seven years ago? There was this time when you just built it and you made money, right? People just came in because it was unique, it was different. Now it's more down to how do you operate, are you good at customer service, what's your throughput, and how many options do you have, not just trampolines. Right. It's the same thing with VR arcades. They're going to be unique for two, three years right now to where if you put enough in and you're in the right environment, you're going to make money. I mean, you right. still got to work, and most of the but bowling it's going to be quick. Centers, you know, already have yeah. good customer and service. The bowling center's already got those people, and they're not going to steal money from another portion of the bowling center. It's all this new. Is, yeah, this is new. People are going to come in just for that. You know, I would suggest eight systems, six. You can start off with four, as long as you realize that, yeah, my return on investment's going to be a little longer, because right. they're going to sit empty, like an arcade machine sits empty Monday through now, Thursday. Now, what's yeah, the big difference everyone's going to ask is yeah. we see a lot of these let's say they're pretty popular, you know, four player in one area right, right. Uh, versus rooms. What, what's the big difference? What's the choice? You know, I would actually say there's a lot of operational difference in it. Uh, and, and I don't think that they're actually exclusive. Like, I don't think that you should go one way or just the other way. I think you should have a mix. You know, having more of like, uh, there is experience out there that's more coin op. It's a five minute experience, four players jump in, they play and then they jump out. Well, you're swapping players every five minutes. That gets kind of time consuming for the employee and things like that. It works great though in a coin op environment, like an sure. arcade environment, right? It's perfect. Um, so I wouldn't never say don't go that route. I'd say put it in a coin op environment or an environment where you've got a lot of traffic sure. that people are just wanting to get in and to get out. And one of the things that blows my mind is uh, LAI came out with the uh, two player uh, non attended virtual rabbits. Yes, and yes. we are basically now grossing more money with that than we see uh, in a full VR set setup. And yet we have, you know, it's so low throughput, only two people at a time. Right. And it's still at five dollars a play. That's doing you know, pretty good, right? Phenomenal numbers. Right. So I mean, we have now a third option. Yeah. And maybe all three. Yeah, and I don't think, like I said, those should all come together. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at opening up location right here in Las Vegas that will have all of those options in the same room. Uh, and the Raving Rabbits, hey, the, the difference that you would see in that one probably like a one player or a two players booth for an arcade, like the ones that we do, right? Yeah. That's gonna cost you 24 grand. The Raving well, Rabbits, that's a- uh, it's, it's 50, right? So yeah, you look at it and you go, yeah, it's gonna gross more, but where's the ROI? Probably the same, probably really close, it's right? It's very close, right? Yeah, now. so and in a coin op, environment, I'd actually say Raving Rabbits would be better it's because no it's attended. just a, yep, no yeah. attendant, you just swipe, you go in. And it's an attraction, yeah. people watch it. That one it. made me a little queasy last time I ran it, but uh, I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure they've improved some of the tracking on it. Yes, people love have. it though, it's a great first virtual reality experience, Yeah. right? We really look for those, I mean, I guess the challenge right now in a lot of virtual reality is people just don't know what it is. Or if they do, they've tried the Samsung Gear or something like that, no, they need to put on a real headset, an Oculus or a Vive, right. and they need to see Google Earth. And what about, what about the, uh, we hear things about young kids, and what, what would be your age requirement? How would you work that? That's actually some funny stories in that one, but uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple for, yeah, for keep here. It simple. 12. 12. I like 12 and up. Uh, yeah, do I let my kids play? Absolutely. I let my kids play, and uh, one of, two of them are younger than 12. Right. Uh, but when you get younger kids in there, especially if it's a one-time experience, it can either be overwhelming, it, the headset doesn't quite fit depending on the size of the child. Right. Um, they love it, because we're, they really we're, do. We're, even, you know, we're working through headsets with the uh, virtual rabbits, yeah. but the you know the younger kids are, are not having any, they're playing it, they're enjoying it. It's, uh, they have a good time, and in, in a raving rabbit situation, I would say younger all the way down to eight. Yeah. Uh, it's in the arcade situation that that's where from eight to twelve, that's up to the parents' the discretion. But we suggest twelve and up. Gotcha. Uh, and there's other reasons why. Uh, with Springboard, we can actually limit what games they see. 
So in a, if an eight-year-old gets in there, we actually just push a button, and it only limits the games that are for eight and younger, which is a pretty sweet feature. That is a very yeah, sweet feature. Because you know there's a lot of cool games out there, the top games, but they're mostly horror and gory, right. very violent. Now, last question. Yeah. We've got to wrap this up. Future for content. Where is it all going to come from, and who's going to create it? I think you're going to get a lot more independent developers. We're, Springboard talks to a lot of these developers who are now making content specifically for VR arcades because they see that licensing model, they see that there's a good model there for them. The bonus with that is you get better and higher quality content. Yes. Now the indie developers were the ones that really pushed VR. Without all those tiny little niche games that we played for five minutes and had a great time, we wouldn't be where we're at now. So some of those uh, providers have actually kind of rolled into bigger companies and they're producing a lot of really cool content. Uh, I think that the IP is going to be important. Raven Rabbids is a good example of that. But when it comes to the arcade style, IP is not as important as just the quality of the game. Because that's more replay. Yeah. Yeah, coin op is more of first impression, arcade more you, replay value. Do you think that our uh, family entertainment center, bowling anchored family entertainment center, that we have a, let's say, we have an edge on all the other sectors oh, yeah. of, of trying new technologies? Oh, yeah and basically leading the way to the future for oh. quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's a cool part of uh, the whole FEC environment, right? We've, uh, we've, we've been through all of the trials, whether it was with the laser tag crash, the trampoline crash, which is going to happen, uh, you know, the, the bowling slowdown, all those things. These operators have already been through that, so they know the best practices. So when they're trying a new product, it's really, they're throwing the best practices into this new product. They've just got to learn the technology and the little nuances sure. with those things. Now those nuances can cause a lot of problems, so it's important to really learn fast. Yeah. We're all, but yeah, you guys, FEC yeah. content or facilities have a huge boost above people who are just trying to jump in. Yeah, and the other advantage I wrote about, I, we're, we're in a unique industry because we're tiered. Yes. We, we have A plus locations, A's, yeah. B's, C's, D's, yeah. and the, uh, the ones who take the initial risk to make money for a while, a year or so, yes. and then they can sell out to the people that have the B's, the C's, the D's, and then go try the next new That's one. That's right. And everybody benefits for years and years and years it, to They come. do, right? And yeah. it doesn't even matter how niche or how right. you know, unique the product is, it does have a very long life in, a, in an entertainment environment, in an entertainment destination. And you're right, yeah, you got those A-class places that uh, try out all the great new things. Sometimes it's great because they filter out some stuff that we don't have to deal with, right? right? But they do a great job in it. There is a, there's a bonus. This whole FEC world, it's a very uh, it's a very friendly environment. You know, it's actually very not competitive, competitive, you know? We do tend to be nice to each other in the whole thing. We are. Yeah, and it's totally different than other environments I've been in when it comes to sales or anything else, or even just operations. Very, yeah. People are very cutthroat, we, but not we, in this one. We do help each other. We do, we do. It's a family. Yeah, no, I've been to competitors' locations and actually brought my team down to play and paid for the paid for the facility uh, just because we really want to help each other out, and then we kind of co-op and some advertising. Oh, yeah. It okay. works. Ryan, thank Thanks. you so much. No, I appreciate the, to, the time. Uh, get your wisdom.